Close your eyes. Now, listen. Open your eyes. You just spent about 30 seconds in my office. It's pretty nice, right? My job is to listen to the soundscapes of wild, amazing places. I've worked in the Amazon. I've worked in Africa out on open savannas. I've walked through swamps with alligators, still listening and I've dodged cacti forest. In all of these places, my purpose was the same, to listen to the birds, because birds tell me great stories. They don't tell me jokes or about the last book they read. And quite unfortunately, they don't whisper to me the secrets of how I can flap my wings just right and take off into flight. That would be cool. But they do tell me very personal stories about their lives, about what's going on in their communities, what's going really well, what's pretty out of whack, and maybe even what dangers are present that they feel might be threatening the future of their community. Because birds are bioindicators. It's a type of animal that's sensitive to environmental change, and therefore, they can tell us what might be changing, what problems might be going on. Birds rely on every part of an ecosystem, the water, the soil, the trees, so if a stream is contaminated, the birds will tell me. If there is an invasive plant that's growing so much that it's choking out all the native plants in a forest, the birds will tell me that also. There are many other things that we call bioindicators that are also sensitive to change. Insects also even mushrooms. But birds are special because they're really noisy. They're making sound all the time, so they're countable. Just imagine for a minute spending hours in a forest listening to mushrooms. I don't recommend it, or maybe I do. You might hear something interesting. but. Birds are always making noise, and they're everywhere. You really can't get away from them. You'll find them in the middle of deserts. You'll find them on ice caps, and even out on the open ocean. So we have this animal that's really loud, and that's pretty much everywhere on this planet. So that's an exciting opportunity for someone like me, who wants to help conservation biology, because they're countable. I can just show up in a place, I know what bird should be there, and I can listen and see if maybe it is there. So I'm going to show you just a little glimpse about what that looks like for me. Here I am in a forest. I center myself, I have my compass, and I get quiet. I take out my piece of paper, and I draw a bullseye. I'm in the center. Each of those circles represents 10 meters away from me. Now, I'm going to stand there for 10 minutes, not really, but for 10 minutes 
and I'm going to listen and do a roll call. Who's here? Who's present? Black throated green warbler. Prothonotary warbler. There's a downy woodpecker. There's a northern cardinal. Ah, there is a hooded warbler. Ah, a wood thrush. And an indigo bunting. So that's what it looks like. I stand there for 10 minutes and I listen. And I have my data sheet that looks like that. It's not as pretty because I'm writing. I don't have the pictures. And that's exactly what I do. So you might have a question. Why don't I just look for the birds? Wouldn't that be easier? It's a good idea, and occasionally I do look. But hearing is so much more powerful than seeing. Because where my eyes go, my vision follows. As much as your parents might have told you they have eyes in the back of their heads, they didn't, I tell you that right now. With hearing, I can stand still and hear 360 degrees around me. I can see with my ears without even having to move. And I think you all can imagine this. Imagine some of the places I work, dense jungles. There are vines everywhere, trees. I'm crowded in. What do you think I hear versus what I can see? So my detection rate is much higher. How did I figure out how to do this? How did I learn to listen to birds? Well, it's not a job that I ever dreamt of doing, and not even one that I imagined existed. All I ever wanted to do was go to Africa and never come back. I wanted to go there and be amongst what I call the magnificent megafauna, big animals, really cool big animals, the elephants and the giraffes. I grew up reading National Geographic magazine. I wanted to be in those places. So I went to university, and I studied wildlife biology on track to do just that. And my junior year, I took an elective, ornithology, bird biology. Here I am on the first day of class. I get my syllabus, and it says that I have to learn 34 unique bird songs. Not just that, I have to be able to identify them in the field. So I'm going to be tested on this. Immediately I panic. Immediately I think, this is absolutely impossible. Who can do that? And my GPA shot. No way, right? It turns out that it actually wasn't impossible. I just had a knack for it. Little by little, I picked up on the nuances of what different birds sounded like. And it wasn't technical at all. I will not make you happy if you want to talk to me about frequency and tone and pitch. It's not that. I just hear the differences. There might be two birds that sound almost identical. But to me, one of them sounds drunk because it's slurring its syllables. And the other one sounds like it's on speed because it's rapid fire and it's not even stopping to take a breath. There might be another two. One sounds like the static on a transition radio where you're trying to get that right channel and you can't quite get it. Or the fast sound of a zipper. And I use no new, uh, mnemonics. I can't say mnemonics very well, apparently. <laughs> but I use them as often as I can. I try to get the bird to say something. And sometimes it's something nonsensical. Sometimes it's something like, here I am, here I am, here I am, where are you? But some of them are just awesome, in my opinion, and they work really well for me. And my favorite one is a bird called a white-eyed vireo. By the way, that bird's about this big. It's not a big bird. Looks huge there. To me, that's, this bird clearly says this. Give me a beer, chick. I hear it every time. Listen, it's a little bit more musical, kind of like, get me a beer, chick. <whistles> See, you heard it. Exactly. Exactly. So this is what happens. I make a mnemonic and I connect with it. 
And then I go to a new place where I've never been, and I hear birds that I've never heard. And I can't arrive there knowing everything, but I carry with me this base of the songs I know. So I'm in Puerto Rico. I've never been there before. It's my first day working on the job. And I hear this bird. It sounds so much like a white eye vireo to me, but I know they don't live there. But it sounds a little too rushed, and it even sounds a little bit rude and impatient. So listen to what I heard. So I'm there with a the local. I'm working with him, and I say, is there a bird that's like this small and has a beak that looks like this? And he says, claro. Yeah, of course. It's the Puerto Rican vireo. Ah, OK. That makes sense. So I have to get a new mnemonic, right? So if a white-eyed vireo says, give me a beer, chick, a Puerto Rican vireo might say something like, give me a rum right now. So impatient. So that's what I do, and that's how I do it. And that's the method to my madness, and it makes sense for me, and it clicks. So I take these things, and I travel to new places. This is Nicaragua. And every single time, I started with a few dozen birds, and then I have a few hundred birds, and my bird vocabulary keeps increasing. And every time I hear a bird that I don't recognize, it screams at me, you don't know what I am. That's all I hear. So it drives me nuts, and I stop, and I listen, and I look, and I figure it out. And then I check it off. OK, that's what that bird sounds like. This skill has defined my career. I started off as a wildlife biologist, a very broad scope. And it's just narrowed me to the point that I became the bird lady. <laughs> Not the crazy bird lady that lives in your neighborhood. A different one. The one that goes on a quest to find birds all over the world just by listening to them. One of those quests happened 10 years ago. I went to Ecuador, to the cloud forest, one of the most biodiverse places on this planet. You have to go there. It's amazing. To give you an example, I was working in 20,000 hectares that could have 1,000 species of birds. All of North America, all of North America, about 600 that are native to North America. So it's amazing. So I go there, and I'm going to look for this bird that's very unique to this area. The cloud forest is its perfect place. It's where it should be. So I'm excited. I've never been there before, and I'm really excited to hear it make this noise. That's what I like, the whistle. So it's pretty hard to miss that sound, right? It's pretty distinct. I am in this cloud forest for two months. I go out every single day. I survey. I listen. I do my method. And I counted exactly zero white-faced birds. There was a vacuum in that soundscape. And sometimes it's exactly what we don't hear that tells us the most, because this bird should be there. This is the perfect place for it to live, the right elevation, the right amount of rain, the right plants. Everything is perfect. But apparently it's not, right, because it's not there. So that takes me to the central core of where I get all the time. Why? Why isn't it there? In my mind, I take it to the basics, the three things all birds need. They need a place to live, they need food, and they need sex. We can all relate to that, right? Pretty basic. OK, the place to live is perfect. Everything I see is perfect. Skip to the sex. It doesn't appear a lot of it's happening because there aren't any of them there. So let's take a step back and look at the food. What does this bird eat? OK, it's a specialist. A specialist is a type of bird that relies on a very specific food source. For example, 
a type of algae in a stream, a specific worm in a tree. So this bird requires insects that live in native fruits, fleshy fruits, those insects that live inside of them. And the bird goes into there and eats that insect. Okay, so that gives me a clue to move forward and figure out what's going on. Come to find out, there are banana plantations on the perimeter of this forest. They're using a pesticide. The pesticide is killing this insect. So, no food, no bird, right? We go further, and I think about this, and it's not just a case of a missing bird and a missing insect. It's a case of ecosystem health and the future of this forest. Because an ecosystem is a web, everything is connected. And you start taking a piece out and another piece out and you never know when the whole thing is gonna fall apart and crumble. And when I talk to the local banana farmers, they got this, they live there, it's their backyard. So they were motivated, they wanted to do something to help the forest. They wanted that song to come back. So I worked with entomologists, I worked with botanists, I worked with a group of people who had specialties I don't have. I have the why. I figured out why it's happening. They had the how. What can we do to fix it? So we move it forward. We have solutions. We find a type of pest control that is organic, and it actually works. Seven years later, I'm thrilled to tell you that the white-faced nunbird is singing loudly again in this forest. It's absolutely amazing. And there are nests that we see that are viable. The food came back. And so did the sex. So they're there. It's a success story. It's amazing. So what I do, I take my tool and it's my ears. My ears aren't that expensive. They're always with me everywhere I go. I don't need expensive equipment. I don't need a laboratory. I just need my ears. And I want to encourage each of you to do the exact same thing. No, I'm not telling you to take my career path. I'm telling you. The next time you go into the woods, take your ears, slow down, listen, pay attention. You don't have to identify everything you're hearing, just connect with it. And I promise you, you'll feel energized. And you might just feel inspired and have this thought, wow. This place is really incredible, and I want to do everything I can to not screw it up. <laughs>